six court cases where dreams was used as evidence. When one thinks of evidence in court, they think of evidence that can be studied and examined by the defense and prosecution. Items such as DNA, fingerprints, video, audio, pictures, etc. But there have been cases that a dream was presented forth. Number 6. Clarence Moses L. Clarence had served 28 years for a rape of a Colorado woman. After a night of heavy drinking, she was indeed raped. She reported this to the police. Saying, it was Clarence's face she had seen in a dream. He was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 48 years. DNA testing had not been done over the years. All the physical evidence had been lost or destroyed. So her dream is all the state has. In 2013 convicted rapist L.C. Jackson sent Clarence a letter confessing to the crime. Jackson had raped another woman and her daughter in 1992. Just a little over a mile from the first lady's home. The letter was enough for a new trial. But it took two years before Denver District Judge Candace Jurds decided to order the new trial. In the meantime Clarence's own mother passed away. As did some of his siblings. The DA is saying the confession letter was a lie. That the Innocence Project convinced Jackson that the statute of limitations is out now. So say you did this and help this other guy out. You can't be convicted. Luckily in December of 2015, Clarence was set free to await a new trial. Which he won and later was paid back, to a degree, what the state owes him. Number 5. Mike Edgar Dossel and Stephen Linskid. September of 1990 Mike Edgar Dossett was sentenced to 40 years for a murder that took place June of 1983. Rachel Kossub was found murdered and half-naked in her office in San Antonio, Texas. There were no defensive wounds on her body. And there wasn't any signs of a robbery. Dr. Susanna Dana did a proper job of examining the body. Collecting hair and nail clippings. Along with swabs of her body. Which there was sperm, but it's the year 1983. And DNA wasn't exactly advanced at that time. In May of 1984 Mike Dossett had a long list of violent crimes against him. So he wasn't exactly a model citizen. But he matched a sketch drawing of another crime in Live Oak. Dossett was brought in for questioning and waived his Miranda rights. In the course of the interview he told the officers about a dream he had been having. His dream had him looking at a woman in an office and her naked butt up in the air. Which just so happened to match Rachel's scene. One of the officers had the thought that this needed the attention of the San Antonio police. The SAPD followed up on this and found no evidence to connect Mike to her murder. Other than the dream, they had nothing, 1995 Detective Tim Britt decided to try his hand at the case. Again, Mike was interviewed but didn't remember the dream as clearly now. But admitted that he told it to the previous officers. Britt asked that Mike give samples again which he did so freely. Upon asking about DNA analyst with Rachel's kit, Britt was hit with the news that the kit was lost. Once again Mike was asked about the dream and signed a statement on it. The case goes cold yet again. Fast forward to 2002 and Detective George Zadler reopens the case. Chief Medical Examiner, Dr. Vincent DiMeo now happens to find Rachel's kit. The samples are degraded, with mold, fungus, and bacteria. But it's still tested and it matches Mike Dossett. The original officers and Detective Britt appeared in court to testify to the dream that Mike told. Dr. Robert Benjamin argued that the samples were contaminated and misused. But the jury sees differently. Mike is now convicted of her murder. Appeals in 2006 further argue about the samples being too damaged to be accurate. And that a dream cannot be used realistically in court. Stephen Linscott was convicted in 1980 for his neighbor's murder. He, like Mike Dossett, told the police he had a dream of a similar murder. Which they took as a confession of the crime. Number 4. Ryan Ferguson. Ryan spent over 10 years in prison because his friend had a dream that they murdered writer Kent Heithold. Ken was found beaten and strangled in November of 2001. Charles Erickson read an article in the newspaper that included a sketch of the possible suspect. Erickson thought the drawing looked like him. And told his friends Nick Gilpin and Art Figueroa that he doesn't remember that night. But has flashes of a dream that he and Ryan committed the murder. The friends tipped the police, and the two were brought in for questioning. Which they were arrested and charged. A janitor at the murder scene was the eyewitness on behalf of the state attorney. But the defense pointed out that none of the physical evidence matched the two boys. However, Erickson was offered a plea deal, so he testified against Ryan. That was enough to send Ryan to prison. Where after years of trying, innocence groups helped get the conviction overturned. As the janitor admitted he had lied on the stand. And Charles claims that he was forced to admit and testify because of the police pressuring him. Number 3. Ron Williamson. Deborah Sue Carter of Oklahoma was found at her home raped and murdered in 1982. She was last seen leaving her job. Ron Williamson and Dennis Fritz were then convicted in 1988 of the murder. Fritz and Williamson were known to eat where she worked. And her friend said the two made her nervous. Her witness Glenn Gore, Ron was at the restaurant that night without Dennis. Dennis is subsequently arrested for the crime in 1987. 
In 1988 another witness comes forward, stating that Williamson threatened to hurt them, just like he had hurt Deborah. So Ron is brought in for questioning. Where he tells of a sexually charged dream he had about Deborah. Hair and other items were said to have matched to Ron. Having enough evidence, Ron was arrested for the murder. Both he and Dennis had jail snitches that say they confessed to the crimes. Overall, it was a poorly conducted investigation. Her body had to even be exhumed over a fingerprinting blunder. The court was also a joke as Ron had a blind lawyer. One that didn't adequately defend him. Ron's first appeal fails for him. In 1995 a federal judge grants him a new trial. This time around, the court recognizes the less than professional investigation. And that the trial attorney for Ron was lacking. That he should have asked for a competency hearing. The dream is thrown out, and the DNA evidence now shows it wasn't a match, not even for Dennis. In a Perry Mason-worthy twist, the witness Glenn Gore was a match. So Ron is set free over the evidence and false testimony being thrown out. Number 2. Robert Scott Terry. Robert was sought over the February 1996 stabbing death of a fellow Canadian. Robert fled to the USA where he was captured and brought back to stand trial. Once convicted, his appeal fought on two issues. One was if he was legally told of his correct rights upon arrest. And if evidence collected could be used in court. Including a poem and a dream about the murder. Both were kept in as they were evidence of his inner guilt of the crime. The Court of Appeal for British Columbia said, evidence admissibility poem dream. Whether or not poems and evidence of dream admissible. It was nevertheless admissible as a link in the chain of inferences tending to establish guilt. Evidence relating to accused's dream too was admissible as part of the narrative of the accused's conduct after the crime. Number 1. Alfred Leroy Presley, Terry Allen Beaton. Alfred was charged in Oregon with the sexual abuse of his seven-year-old daughter. After an anonymous tip of abuse, the child was taken into custody of the Children's Services Division. In an interview with a caseworker, the little girl said her dad had put his fingers in her PP area. Later at her foster mother's, the kid was hurt to cry out, Daddy, get off me. Daddy, stop, leave me alone, through a dream. Oregon laws had a state of mind exception on hearsay rules. Even though the defense claimed the girl was giving false claims, the dream utterances were admitted. However, in appeals the dream evidence was overturned. As there was no concrete proof there was a direct connection. Another case in Oregon was similar. Terry Allen Beaton was on trial for the sexual assault of his wife's nine-year-old girl. She was having violent dreams that led to Terry being accused of sexual assault. Terry said that the girl had cried out a real dad's name, Bob, while dreaming. So she was confusing the two. The defense lawyers argued that the dream should be thrown out. But the court decided that it could be used.